Okay, so people joining us remotely, hello. People in the room, welcome. A very warm welcome to Dr. Martin Schneider. He's joined us all the way from Germany today, for which we're very grateful. Um, Martin Schneider is from the Lower Saxony Institute for Historical Coastal Research in Wilhelmshaven in Germany. Um, and your research focuses on coastal and island archaeology and the southern North Sea and Western Baltic Sea coasts, um, which resonates a lot with what we're trying to do here in Orkney, um, researching locally on Orkney islands and, and the sort of um, Scottish, Norwegian areas, but also thinking more internationally and seeing connections again. So we're very, very excited to hear more about your research. Um, I'll get the presentation up and share. There, and from the beginning, and now we should be ready to go. Thank you. Over to you, Mike. Yeah, so people should be able to see what we're seeing up mm -hmm. there, and you just move it on to the cameras. Okay. Hello, everyone. Seth, I'm Martin from North Germany, and I like to work on island archaeology, and so it's well fitting to, to give a, a lecture here on the Orkney Islands. I would like to introduce my matter of research and some aspects of that. Um, I, um, to give you a geographic orientation, the red arrow indicates the, the position of the North Frisian Islands. Uh, and you see it's just across the North Sea. We just take a boat from Orkney and sail over or vice versa. Um, so the North Sea is in our eyes a zone, a communication zone, um, which was open and it was used widely to go back and forth. And uh, the dimensions we think today are very long and very wide and we can't go like that to travel to Scotland or so. People think uh, thought otherwise uh, in the past. They were very mobile uh, with their boats, and um, I think that's a very interesting aspect. When you um, work on islands, coastal archaeology, people sailing along the coast. Um, yeah, they, they had a, a, it was a medium for communication and traveling, and I think that's quite interesting. This uh, are the North Frisian Islands, Zurich, Föhr, and Damo. Zurich is the northernmost, and Föhr is the one in the middle. You can see Zurich and Ambrum are barrier islands lying out there at the coast, uh, the outer coast, um, facing stormy events. Um, they, they are very vulnerable for erosion and change their shape, at least if uh, Mother Nature is allowed to do so. Um, the Föhr lies further in, in, uh, inside and is protected by the other ones. Um, so they all consist of uh, marshes and moraine areas and also sandy beaches, dunes and so on. So they have, have a variety of landscape zones. I grew up on the island of Amur and I was always wondering why nobody was interested in those islands. Why? Because they have a very abundant uh, archaeology. They have together more, much more than 1,000 grave mounds, for example. And they have a little very big record of um, archaeological sites, but uh, it's too far away from the University of Kiel. So uh, scholars were not really interested and nothing much happened. And that was, of course, good for me. So I could do everything <laughs> all the others had not done before. And I would like to give you some ideas about what's going on there. One of the most interesting matters is the, the fortresses on the island. They derive from the Viking Age. And you see a map from 1650 on the left side where they are already indicated um, and possible other places with fortifications as well. But uh, we talk about the Timmenburg and Boxenburg now. They, their name derives from the villages close by. And um, you see they are very well preserved. This is no reconstruction like in Denmark with the Trelleborn, you know, the 
to be reconstructed, but these are real and um, they were just not plowed to net low uh, or destroyed, they were just forgotten in the landscape. Mm -hmm. And uh, the thing is that there were some small scale excavations, so we knew about the dating of the fortresses, but otherwise, nothing was known about uh, the area around them, their archaeological context, their meaning. Um, except dating, there were many questions, but very few answers. And um, they were like aliens in the landscape, in a way. I think uh, people were always wondering where they for, what this is, why did they do all the work? There were a lot of questions. Um, and there was, yeah, we did not know about them. Everyone found them peculiar, and um, it was like the aliens had dropped them somewhere. <laughs> And nobody knew what, why they did it. This is to start with Zürich. This is the Tinnenburg, and you see the red areas are some small scale excavations, and some um, Viking Age pottery was found, and some wooden items, and they did some traces of houses. But otherwise, nothing much was going on. Um, but that changed when. Um, Around 50 years ago, uh, we conducted uh, larger rescue excavations in the areas which are indicated with red and green. And um, there was an industrial, industrial compound to be constructed there, and in advance, archaeological excavation were carried out. And um, that was um, quite surprising because everything was full of archaeological structures. And on this map, I show you the um, former uh, tidal creeks in the marsh before it was embanked. And you see that uh, it's like a waterway system, and one of the waterways passes the rampart and goes further up to the drain mm -hmm. area and ends up where the settlement, uh, the remains of the settlement from the Viking Age were found then. So suddenly there was a connection, there was um, an archaeological context, and that was quite exciting. You see some of these areas with a lot of uh, some feature builded big buildings or pit houses and uh, some wells and so on. And um, on the right side, there are some of these um, some feature buildings uh, seen, and they are uh, very well preserved. And we found a lot of nice finds. Um, and if you want to give you an overview, these some feature buildings were. Very small, they were stellar, um, strong image, and um, so these were weaving huts. We found a lot of balloon weights, and um, they were not meant to uh, inhab be inhabited all year long. They were weaving huts, and I think they, they were used seasonally. Um, some of them had earth, but most of them didn't. Um, yeah, but obviously, a lot of uh, very um, productive textile um, yeah, production took place. And you have, might have heard about the Frisian cloth, which was very famous in that time in the 8th and 10th century. It was um, a commodity which was um, valued on the market and it was sold up the line and so on. So the cloth from Frisia, from the wool of the Frisian sheep, was very good. And people wanted it, and so it was a good trade commodity and was produced in these little huts. Well, the um, building activities went on. I got a phone call from a helper on, from the island, and he said, I'm going crazy. There's amber and everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. he, I think he thought, I thought he yeah. exaggerated. Um, well, and we came over anyway to help him and uh, started water sieving the contents of the houses. And <laughs> he wasn't lying, it yeah. was the truth. And we found 3.5 kilogram of raw amber, which was just thrown away. It was uh, garbage because it wasn't, it wasn't usable for beads or pendants like you see in the upper corner. Um, so it was uh, sorted out and just thrown into the houses. This is crazy if you think of um, Hebe and Aitabu. Here we have approximately the same amount of amber from all the excavations. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, 
So I also thought about this context con concept of ritual waste, which sometimes uh, spoken about. I could well imagine that also to be here true, because we found some small bits with a lot of amber pieces in them, and they had some uh, signs of iron. But um, and there were other signs of ritual behavior. But um, anyway, we found very much amber. And not only that, we also found a lot of glass beads and the glass shirts from the Rhineland. And these glass shards, they were remote and uh, on the spot, they were um, reshaped into beads. But also, um, Roman tesserae from the mosaics were used to reproduce beads. And so they had a strong production, not only in rural textiles, but also in amber goods like beads and pendants. And the glass beads are also high in demand, obviously. And this is like uh, on the front door to Riebe. So Riebe is, of course, one level higher. Um, but here, similar things happen uh, on the way to Riebe, and they took place and they took part of this uh, trade going on and the production. So suddenly, something new, a new aspect was available to understand uh, the ring shaped rampart of the Pinnenburg. It wasn't an alien anymore, but it had a, had a very interesting context and it explained why there was a fortress protecting this site uh, because it had a strong economic importance and had to be yeah, protected. And of course, also the revenue, the taxes had to be collected. Um, so that was really helpful to, um, to give this film um, board meaning. And this is the other rampart on the island of Föhr, uh, Boxenburg. It's kind of funny because the village around uh, near the um, rampart is called Borksum, which means the village at the Borg. And the Borg was again uh, named after the village, so it's like a circular thing. <laughs> and um, this is even better preserved um, a wonderful monument standing at least eight meters tall. Um, there were very small scale excavations going on, showing that there was. Um, from the Viking Age, but the, ex the, the guy in charge was Herbert Jan Kuhn. I know his uh, name is, you know, not without problems in archaeology. And he wanted to find a Trelleborg, like they were available in Scandinavia or present in Scandinavia. And he was totally disappointed when he found out that it wasn't. <laughs> it was, um, he saw that the houses were orientated in a radial way and were not uh, like, you know, from the Trelleborg in the squares. Waters, but it was different here. So he immediately lost interest and handed this excavation over to his assistant and went back home. That was good for me. <laughs> <laughs> that was in the fifth, beginning of the 50s. And since then, we, nearly nothing happened. Um, on the island of Fur, there is a society very interested in the history of the island. And they spoke with me and asked me if. If anything could be done to un better understand the, the fortress without paying a lot of money, I recommended geophysical um, examinations and they were carried out um, 20 years ago from Kiel University. And here you see the results it's the height model. And then in the middle, it's the geomagnetic <coughs> model with a lot of anomalies. And uh, in the bottom, it's the um, Ground penetrating radar. And you see that the just on the magnetics, magnetism and the radar are very clear. There is very well visible uh, good structures. In the middle, you see two rows of black anomalies. Um, they fit well to the um, radar anomalies, which you can see better here. And you see the old trenches of Yankun on the left side. You see a very regular pattern of uh, house walls standing close to each other, and they go all around the rampart. So it might be 50 houses or so. And uh, in these houses were the hearths, and they produced these magnetic anomalies. So it fits well together. And the center is not used because it was too wet. And even now, it is really like a lake in the winter time. Children like to go skating there, ice skating. <laughs> it's like a, a, a theater, a stadium. And um, so, without doing, without any digging, we could see a lot of 
information uh, concerning the, the buildings and the empire. It was, of course, exciting, but it took another 20 years to do uh, archaeological excavations, really. Um, first, we had to uh, understand the area around the rampart. Like on Zürich, we had this hint that um, we found this trade place close to the fortress. And so we wanted to know if it's the same on Fur. And we find similar places with the um, traders and crafts. And uh, that was the aim of the project from the German Research Foundation, which we carried out. But uh, first, um, another information with these um, very sharp images, which were totally surprising to German scholars, because we had one big problem. And this is called uh, Maulwurf or Mole. I don't know what it is in Scandinavian language. Uh, yeah. I don't think you have them here on off me. No. Oh, that's so we lucky. Have <laughs> <laughs> Rabbits are not that bad. <laughs> take care that you won't get molds here. This is really very important. Uh, you see the cross section through all the um, all the ways the mold is digging in the ground and firmly is turbulencing all the layers and everything will be upside down and you have just a it spots everywhere, and you can't see the archaeological features on the Rambo. Luckily, we don't have that on Fur and the Rambo, but nowadays on Zurich, um, they are is actually. Is there is a dike, yeah. There's a, um, but I don't know why they came up, came over there, <laughs> but uh, it's, it's, a problem, it's a big problem. But, um, well, if you see it in the other way, uh, in Hedebu, in Hedebu, they are everywhere. If you spend an, a euro on fur, it is worth double if you spend it for excavation if there's one uh, opposite to the um, excavations on the mainland. So that's, it, I think it's a huge advantage. So mm -hmm. we do not have these modes. I hope it will always be like that. It also shows that the islands were always isolated. They were not connected to the mainland. So um, and it's very good that we do not have these modes in the island. I wish you the very same for. <laughs> Good. We had this um, example from Zurich, and now we wanted to figure out if there were um, trade and craft settlements, other places close by, which would also give this fortress a meaning, a context. And uh, so we started um, checking uh, the landscape. And uh, a friend of mine, Esben Schlocher Mauritsen from mm -hmm. um, Alstoball Museum, he is an aerial archaeologist, and I asked them to him to fly over the islands without any great expectations. And he came back in June 2006, and it was just overwhelming what he found. He had several settlements from migration period, from Viking Age. Great. Uh, yeah. That was very lucky, and you see it's very clearly visible the pit house, the pelvis, or uh, some future buildings, the dike, the ditches, the roads. Wells, all this could be seen from the air already. So the next step was to do geomagnetism. And you see that it's just crazy how clear the image is. Um, at least uh, for Germany, it's not possible somewhere else. You see all the features. Um, you don't need to do an excavation, more or less, or only very small scale excavation. You see the red areas. These were our excavations in the project. And um, again, we found um, pit houses very well preserved with a lot of bloom weights and a spindle wall with pseudo -leven, well, letters, I would say. Looks like, what do you think? <laughs> 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 can, can come back. Yes. Can come back uh, to that on the discussion. So it, it was broken into three fragments. We found two of them, and they were deliberately put into the corners of one of the houses. So it was, again, an interesting finding without any similar finds in Northern Germany. Some of the loom rates are decorated. Uh, that's another thing. Um, nobody really knows what it's good for. Is it just decoration or is it a marking of special strings or so? And they are very abundant in these uh, layers in the pit. 
And water sieving is essential. Um, you need the small finds to get the historic to get the historic interpretation right. And uh, it is very fruitful, even if it takes a lot of time. You see um, shards of uh, drinking vessels, or from beakers, or decorations, the Gella and others. Um, nice blue colors and um, Pesare, the two uh, pieces of, above this golden beak. Uh, all, most of these finds are very similar to the stuff which was found in Beaver. So we're really on the way to Beaver and also from Beaver back to the islands where we have many goods came along and this blue beak with the red and white uh, decorations, absolutely typical for Beaver. Um, we, we, yeah, it's obvious that we are in the in, in a sort of connection with Beaver. If you know it's a very, very important place. The English was called First Town in Denmark. It was a very important trade market. Uh, the Frisians were connected with this trade. They had the, yeah, they were up the Rhine and all over the North Sea and other, uh, other places to, to bring things back and forth. On the North Frisian Islands, they were under some sort of protection of the Danish kings. And so they could remain pagan two hundred years longer than out all the other Frisians for the south. So nice finds in the sea, and what does it mean? Um, the Boxenburg is indicated, and the island of Hör with all the Viking Age um, sites is shown here. And we do have some settlements, like the one uh, you have seen in the pure magnetic image. There is a lot of um, graveyards. In single finds and at least two coins. So, through this work of the project and older finds, which were not very much uh, connected to the fortress before, I think a pattern emerges and we are able to say something about the archaeological context of the fortress, which is most important in my eyes. And you have seen that we, again we have these settlements open house settlements maybe used seasonally used for um, production for trade and crafts they were um, manageable by ships and uh, so the whole thing was a very maritime culture connected to the north sea trade north and south along the coast uh, to scandinavia from Frisia, and from the carolingian empire and we are somewhere in the middle and uh, that's also important if we think about what what are these um, fortresses and who built them and who tolerated them and what were they good for? But uh, first, um, before I come to that, we also have a, a little project within these excavations uh, dealing with the landscape uh, archaeology and you see the LIDAR image of the island of Kerr and and uh, a PhD thesis is being worked on that topic. And uh, Pierre, who is doing this, he took the LED LiDAR images and filtered them back deliberately. And it was just amazing what he could draw out of the existing data if he you know, had the right questions uh, set. And um, you see all the landscape features, like uh, pilot creeks, little uh, beach walls, Sandbars and um, yeah, some moraine islets popping out of the marsh. Um, all this is totally flat. If you stand there in the landscape, you don't see anything. It is um, high differences of ten to twenty centimeters. But if the filter is set on the right level, suddenly you see things you don't see before. And that was most helpful to understand how the landscape, marsh landscape, was looking like before the dike was built. Yes. But, so that's his job, and again, we see a lot of creek structures. And uh, again, but uh, this is uh, very clear. But of course, we don't know how old they are. We just know that they are older than the dike. And so his job right now is to do a lot of corings um, in these structures and find some creek layers and so on to get at least an idea about how old these island creeks might be. Well, after uh, digging around, 
the red part and doing these open sites with the trade and crafts character characteristics. Um, somebody said, well, what's what's the matter with the fortress itself? And they said, oh, I can't go in there. I can't excavate in the fortress. It's a protected monument. And he said, no, no, no. Well, you have to do it. And otherwise, you will never understand what's going on. And I was thinking about it and thought he was right. And uh, and there's a Swedish billionaire living on Thur. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I sent an application to him and I got the answer back. This is not serious. It's too low. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So I uh, changed the numbers and the, uh, I got the funding. And since two years we are doing the excavation stuff. It's crazy, but uh, it's, it's, yeah, it's cool. But I, I wouldn't have the idea my wouldn't have had the idea myself, but it, it, somehow it came came to me, so to say. Um, if we have a look at this profile, um, you see um, a white layer of sand topping the structure, the areas with structure, and it seems that the houses were flattened, they were destroyed, and uh, in the end, a white a layer of white sand was spread over. Uh, deliberately to mark the end of the use of the fortress around the year 1000, let's say. And um, after that, we cannot find any use of the rampart, but before there are four sediment layers uh, which pile up to uh, at least two meters of cultural layers. Um, not too many finds, but some finds, and you see. Um, Yes, in this area, this is a place of war, and yeah, they piled the clay socks up, and, and that was a very good way to build, uh, not needing too much wood. And so all these houses, at least from the last phase, and uh, these shifting houses were built like that, from clay socks, and uh, also the rampart itself is. Um, yeah, most of it was built up from caissons. They are very good um, building material, and, and yeah, you can see how they did it. This is the pottery lying in the corner of the house. These are um, floor layers, one on top of the others. And so that's the wall of the house, and the next house is, is here. So they were really close uh, side by side with each other. And that's the pot, and um, you see it was repaired. Mm -hmm. And it is um, so called Heiterbu Preschanware, Hedebu Wilfram Pottery. And it was Hedebu that where there was a potter who was a, a professional producing pots on the wheel. And um, we found many, many, many of those shells. So they must have imported a lot of pottery from Heiterbu. Which was on the other side of the Jewish Peninsula, of course. So there again were contacts and um, good transportation and exchange. We also found Slavonic pottery, which was kind of a surprise. Um, but the Hilbu had it as well. So it wasn't very you know, restricted. This was like an open trade zone, I think. And yeah, and also other stuff from other areas was to be found. We found inside the rampart quite some glass beads, I think 12 of them now. Again, water seeding, I think, uh, is essential. And uh, this is, of course, difficult to understand. Why is why are there glass beads in a fortress? And it was, you would think of a military uh, purpose, uh, but obviously, also there, I think, some trade, uh, these are the uh, storing of goods. Took place, and uh, it's not a very military uh, character, character of the finds we can see. Yes, seeding, and then water seeding. Um, it's not very popular among students. <laughs> yeah, I, I have to tell them every, every time no, no, you have to do that. You have to keep an eye, and before you turn the seed, somebody else has to look into it. So you know that stuff, um, and it's uh, yeah, some moaning is going on. But mm -hmm. then, as soon as the first glass bead turns up, uh, 
I was always very much in favor of seaweed and water. <laughs> so it's, it's fun to see. You see, um, in the background here, we have the clay salts piled up just to explain to the people what it's about. And they speak about walls and so on. It's very kind of abstract, but um, this helps to demonstrate. We have a photographer uh, on the gig. We, we try to um, invite people who are not no students or archaeologists to take take sorry to take part in the excavations or in the project and she is a photographer on the island of her uh, who usually does uh, death metal concepts <laughs> <laughs> you can see it in there um, but i think those images are great because my opinion at least on a german archaeologist is that they are unable to make really good uh, excavation photos of people. So always kind of, you know, everyone runs out of the image or you see people from behind all the time. So I asked her specifically to uh, make uh, photos out of her perspective. And I think it turned out nicely. And you see our problem here, the, the rampart is a very popular touristic destination. So every, every time people linger around here on the wall commenting on what is going on, Oh, they found the sunglass. Mm -hmm. you know, somebody put the sunglasses on. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, you get, you get used to that. This is a drone image of one of the Lanum, um, and uh, you see that the clay socks are um, rectangular. And this, this is the one wall of the house, and then the wall of the neighbor's house is here. They were standing shoulder to shoulder. This is the remains of a fireplace, a hearth. And this is a later structure going over all this. And you see the floor was put together with single socks. So it's kind of like this pattern of like a movie. Um, again, clear pictures. Sometimes it's difficult to understand. It takes a lot of time to document it. Um, um, yeah, we are not as far as I'm usually wish it, but um, yeah, what can you do? So I asked for a few more years, maybe. Um, <laughs> and this is the, um, the drawing of the plan woman. And the colors give um, the colors you can separate, faces and structures. But, uh, for example, this row of posts, we don't really know what it's good. It seems when the houses were laid down that some other structure, at least in this area, was built. But what for? I am not there. An idea how the houses might have been standing. Um, these are from first sort houses on Iceland. And of course, they are similar, but they are, the houses on Firth didn't look exactly like that. But just to give you an idea of how close to each other the houses were built and with these fixed thick sod walls, I think this is a good comparison. Um, last year, we ran into an area where there was a lot of wood in the ground, which was surprising. Mm -hmm. Because um, when you see, um, usually clay sod buildings are supposed, people, scholars think they are, they uh, turn up there where there is no wood built in all the houses. Well, we had all these place of walls, but we also found a lot of wood in the secondary use. Wide, wide uh, boards and large beams, and so good wood. And they made it, they used it uh, as a substruction for a floor for a stable. So there were many uh, prints on top, and um, it was kind of you know, difficult to understand why they used this wonderful wood. For such a basic purpose. But of course, I was really happy about it because wood means that, that we can do then the chronology. And this is again a drone photo of this uh, substruction of a, a stable floor. You see the walls of the stable on top here and there. So these were the sides of the stable, and there was a, of a compartment. And all of this was covered with hoof prints and bones and a lot of, um, yeah, all kinds of 
organic um, metals like hay, straw, and which was of course very interesting. And the botanical analysis shows us that uh, you know, the area around the rampart is had a mosaic of very different eco ecological zones, swamps, woods, salt marshes, and very this is all in, in this layer of um, put together by the plant remains and um, this is uh, again very interesting to understand how different the landscape looked like a thousand years ago. Um, and you, you tend to think that it was always like this, and once you see it and say, okay, must have always been like this, but it wasn't. So a lot of wood means dendro baby. So you took the sauce and cut all the yeah. Most of it was oak actually. So we cut in like 20 samples of and I brought them to Copenhagen to uh, <coughs> Ifa Bailey. Oops, sorry. <laughs> Spoiled my <laughs> 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 Um Yes, dendro baby. Ifa was I told her it is really important and I need the results uh, as soon as possible and it was very friendly and um, sent me the results very uh, in a very short time and um, we had a bet going on in the excavation team and uh, that started from 800 AD to 1100 that's a wide area but I thought all the people betting for the time around 1,000 um, are way too young. Mm -hmm. But it um, was quite different. You see, um, this is grouped by, by trees. So some wood, one, some planks belong to the same tree, indicated with the same color. And um, the blue ones, um, no, I'm sorry, it's not the same tree, same tree but the same yeah, group of woods. And um, we have um, the last remaining tree ring is from, uh, is from well, this is this one, AD 969. This tree ring is actually there. And then uh, this wood here, this plank goes further out, but it misses the young, the splint wood, I think it is indeed. So we have to add at least another 20 years. And um, when I tell this to German scholars, they say, so what? <laughs> but when I tell it to Danish scholars or Scandinavian scholars, they say, what, 980? Because uh, for Scandinavian scholars, it's a very important period of time. And then, uh, so the exciting thing is that um, this is the time of Hala Yutu, and uh, he did a lot of construction work in Denmark, like the, the, the red spots is where uh, the Halleborn were built. They have more or less the same dating within, within 10 years plus or minus. And um, suddenly we are with our rampart our fortress in a very important political phase where it was big turmoil in Denmark. He, um, he fought against the chief, local chieftains, he wanted to implant the Christianity and so on. So he wanted to make, or he did uh, found this uh, kingdom, Denmark, Norway, a large uh, structure with uh, only one king and um, you know that um, the boat race, for example, in Oseberg, um, they got robbed at the same time. And, um, so it's it's a very um, important political phase where a lot of infrastructure is You can stop sharing if you want. If you want to go back to last slide or would you like to stop? No, no, I okay. made a mess. No, it's good. <laughs> <there. laughs> Thank you. Um, this the political phase is, is most interesting, and um, there's a lot of things going on. As, um, this Scandinavian society is deeply impacted by, by that Harald Bluetooth, and he wants to change everything. And um, 
Obviously, at just at the same time, our fortress gets the last refurbishment with these around 50 houses standing, I, can, I would say, like a garrison, fully structured, uh, fully, you know, totally the same houses. It's a it's a hand structure, very equal, and it's not a Trelleborn, but it's at the same time of the Trelleborn, and it has a very functional design. So, is it a, maybe, is it a Trelleborn in the end? Mm -hmm. Or does it have the function of the travel board? I think if Jan Kuhn would have known, he would have, um, <laughs> would have continued. But that, that was my job. No? Um, a lot of questions, but uh, it's very exciting to end up in this period of time. And I hope that we can prolong the excavations for uh, some more years. Um, because I think it's, um, yeah, it's just cool that we have these results right now with the temple dating. And to finish up, um, you know that uh, Harald Bluetooth, he had indeed a Bluetooth, it's a, I think so, at least it's a medical, rare medical condition. People have a Bluetooth because it dies, mm -hmm. and then certain it's dyed blue, and obviously, well, I think that's when he got his name. And the funny thing is that um, one of the inventors of the Bluetooth format for um, software. Yeah, um, that we're using right now. Absolutely. <laughs> And this guy, he had written, he read a book about the Viking voyages and so on, and that's why he decided to call this device Bluetooth. And you know the Bluetooth sign here, <laughs> this, and it's two rooms. He could explain better, but it's um, an H and a B, all right, Bluetooth, and then connected, put together. And that's what we use today as the Bluetooth sign. Thank you very much. <laughs> Yes, now we're going to take questions both from the room and from people online. Um, and people online can, can type in the questions. Um, I don't know uh, if among the participants is NTNU connected. If we can see attendees here. Oh no, maybe I have to open up. Like, ah, yes, hi, we're here. I, I was going to see if I could upgrade NT and you to panelists so that you're able to speak as well. But I think I need to do that from my computer. Um, we must stop sharing. And then go to. Can I ask a question for you? Yeah. yeah. I uh, thank you. That was a really, really interesting talk. Fascinating and such uh, amazing work you're doing. Um, thank you. So I have a few questions, but but one of the <laughs> questions that I'd like to ask is to do with the evidence for traded goods and that you've been finding in the, the sort of settlements around the fortresses, which you're drawing and you're drawing parallels with Hedy Bay and, and Riva. Do you, do you think that this is evidence of a trading settlement, or are they producing goods for trading? Here, you know, so it's the trading activities. Is it like Reba, like a smaller version of Reba? I guess is what my question is. Good question. How to answer? Um, I think they produced it in the settlements, but it was actually traded in another place, maybe in the fortress. Okay. It would also be a possibility that the, the, the market was in fortresses. So people are coming here, it's, it's acting as a market focus. It's not just I that they're so, yeah. working on yeah. goods and then going elsewhere to trade them. They're actually, it's I a, think the goods were traded on the island. Yeah. Okay. So that's really interesting. Isn't it? <laughs> We've got a, a question come in, in the chat. Um, I can just scroll up to see the star. Um, yes, Colleen Bates is asking. Fascinating and wonderful preservation. I have visited Timmerenburg on Sid several times and presumed it was related more closely to Ost Solberg. Is this the case? There's an importance in the date of the Sunday floor building now in both Shetland and Iceland, which is important. I think great finds and links with Liebe. 
you want to comment on that? Um, and one. here's the here's the place now. Oh, it's so oh, good. So good. Yeah, it is uh, in the province of Zeeland in the Netherlands. There are four to five similar fortresses, um, and they are it's a long discussion. And who built those? Well, was it the Vikings settling there and like the Frankish people protecting themselves against the Vikings? Um, they are also very well structured and uh, deliberately constructed, uh, but they, they had a very uh, short um, period of use. Um, there are similarities, but there are certainly differences. And I am in contact with the colleagues from there to, to see, um, to <coughs> understand. But I think they are a different phenomenon. They are not, it's not the same. That's as far as I can go. And a friend of mine, Michael Bartels from um, the Museum in West Frisia, he's he did an excavation on the island of Tessel in, uh, in the Netherlands. And this uh, has also a rain core. And it's also a Stronghold with open settlements around it. That's actually now the best parallel with the fortresses on Zurich and Höher. But I think post Duburg, uh, to me, it looks rather like a um, Frankish um, implantation for the protection of the coast. Um, I'm not a, yeah, that's my personal guess. Thank you. So our friends at NTNU, you are now Hello. one of your panelists. You can speak. Yeah, does anybody over there want to ask any questions? Um, just to say thanks very much for uh, letting us connect. Um, you can hear us okay, yeah? Yes. Yeah, yeah. we're um, we're uh, six, uh, six or seven uh, of us. I'm here with some bachelor students, and it's we have uh, meetings now and again, and we're very enjoyed the talk. It's very interesting to see the, the method with the uh, geophys and the aerial photography and then the pinpoint excavations. So that was, thanks very much for that. Um, I was going to ask, um, it's recorded, it's by the 900s. It's, there's quite a degree of complexity, of course, in the Viking uh, world and in settlements. But is there, you, you alluded to it at one stage, is there much... Um, direct sign of any northern, I mean, sort of uh, Norwegian uh, connections in the bones or in any kind of antler or? Uh, the North Frisia is um, the typical characteristics of the North Frisian uh, Viking Age archaeology that it is an amalgam of Scandinavian and Frisian Western, Southwestern influences. And we do have uh, oval bridges in the graves on the islands, very Scandinavian. Um, and it, it's really a mixture, and I think that was the big advantage for the islands in that time, that they were like a connect, connecting point, a leading point. Um, and it seems that only the cemeteries that uh, the, the Scandinavian and Frisian people um, buried their people side by side. That's, that's the impression you, you get. Um, so, I think the, the, um, the borders, borders were very open and uh, people were moving back and forth. Um, but even in itself, I would think, has a very strong Frisian impact. Uh, I could not imagine Hebel without Frisians. And, um, and so we are in a zone, like a free trade zone, um, as well in Hidebu, you know, there were Slavonic people, there were Frisians, there were Saxon people living in. Danish and so on. Um, that was, um, it's very difficult to set, really separate it. I think people were yeah. very open to, yeah, and they spoke several languages, I think, and I don't know yeah. what they were, themselves would call them. If they said, oh, I'm, I'm Danish or Asian, or um, maybe. Yeah. It, yeah. It, it probably would have been very interesting to stand there and watch them trading and the different groups and you know and they had a lot of commonalities but they were also very differentiated maybe in the way they dressed and the, what they spoke and 
it must have been very interesting to stand there and watch all the different yeah. connections. That's true. I wish we could. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, practical question. Uh, uh, um, how how is your when is your season? When during the year is your season? How long can you keep uh, excavating? Oh, we we are uh, dependent on the um, on the summer time when students do not have a lecture time, and we we wouldn't like to excavate in the winter, but spring to autumn is fine and uh, well what we call summer is i think sometimes like here on the orkneys <laughs> very cold and wet um and then we wish you would have done the excavation in this wonderful dry january <laughs> period uh, yeah right but the, the, we start from the end of june and finish in the beginning of september mm. yeah. so please come along and visit us yeah, we maybe we have some uh, clever uh, students from NTNU we can send you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. you Thanks very much and best of luck. Have... Mm? If any of the clever students have questions, they're very welcome to ask them. Yeah, of course, Anna. Anyone? Okay. Uh, they, uh, they went muted, uh, Ragnil. Okay. <laughs> Do you have any questions in the in the room? Yeah. Martin, the, the beats that you found, have you any idea of the use of them? Were they actually being because I think a number of them were found in the, the pit houses where you established that they were making textiles. So the beats being incorporated into the textiles, or are they just adornment? I think that uh, they have nothing to do with the textiles because you in the in the lower uh, on the floor you find the loom weights mm -hmm. and spindle worms and then in the in the filling of the pit houses mm -hmm. then then they are spread here and there. Yeah. So I think they were put for, by chance uh, ended up in the pit house. Um, it would be a lovely idea to see them integrated into the textiles um, as it was done later on. Um, it is, uh, it, oh yeah, the function, yeah. I think they were playing beat with, mm -hmm. you call this the necklace, the yes. beads, yeah. Mm -hmm. The lovely variety of colours in them as well. It would have been really interesting to see how they would have combined them mm -hmm. all and you've got the different shapes as well. It's true, there's also a rock crystal and um, there's, well, there's other materials as well. Um, I was totally surprised by the, by the freshness of the colors. It's a very good glass because they recycled also the old Roman material and um, you stand at the sieve and it's so fleshy that you think it can't be old. Somebody has done a trick on you or something like that. <laughs> and then it reoccurs and you can compare, compare the colors of the beads with the, with the cassava and the drinking vessels and it fits well. They also carried out glass uh, analysis and you can, yeah, the glass comes from the uh, Cologne area, from the Rhineland mostly. Um, and so it's pretty, pretty clear what was going on. And glass beads were in high demand and maybe you know the source where it said that the glass bead is as valuable as a margins uh, um, fur. Or a, a little silver coin. So they sometimes people think about it where there's some sort of payment as well. Mm -hmm. They had a defined value. I, I um, had this idea in my head that um, <coughs> ring forts were associated with heraldry too. So I, I was not very surprised when you revealed it at the end, and it made me wonder. Are there any ring forts that are dated clearly outside the period of, of her Bluetooth reign mm -hmm. that are not associated with him and anywhere else? Yeah. Yes, there are um, older ring uh, fortresses, and what I didn't say, I'm sorry for that, these fortresses on the islands, they had a running time of about 300 years. Oh. They start at eight, in the eight centuries. We mm -hmm. find material from the eight centuries, 
and then they are in use, maybe not continuously, but then they build up layers and this is four settlement layers um, from the 8th century to the year 1000. So they were standing there for centuries in the landscape and were in use and I think it was Harald Bluetooth, it was just simple, but oh, there are some Trelleborn already, I just reconstructed a little and I can't build anything in the middle because it's so wet. So they just they just arranged themselves with, with what which what was there. And um yes, they they, they are older um, they yeah, they are older the, the, the fortresses are also in Saxony, they have them by the dozens. Mm -hmm. And then around the year one thousand they came out of use in Middle Europe, but uh, in the Slavonic area, they were uh, continuously used for uh, longer 200 years, along as older, uh, you know, later. Mm -hmm. So, up to 1200, I think we have uh, fortresses with this ring shaped um, occurrence. But uh, it's, a, it's a complex and difficult topic, um, and we would have to do much more research. Our excavation leader is uh, Dr. Kessie Bieser, and she is. Um, she has the uh, job when we finish the excavation to make a nice book <laughs> and address all these questions. There's a question here on the chat. Are there any significant different significant differences between the finds on the three islands, or are they very similar? And they are very similar. Um, Amrum is a bit smaller, so we do not have um, a fortress. But we do have open settlements as well, and they have, again they produce pit houses, um, loom weights, glass beads. Um, I would think of the three islands as one cultural zone. As, as, um, yeah, they, they had a strong exchange, and there wasn't there were no big differences. Mm, thanks. I have no QO questions, so it's open. Anybody can I ask another one? Now? Yeah, um, is there any evidence for um bone working, um, you know, for production of anchor or, or other types of, of bone working? Um, very poor, mm. and that's because the, the soil is so acidic. Yes, that's our problem. We do not find nice bone tools, and um, human bones is only available in, in uh, when it was when the people got cremated then, then they are resistant but otherwise uh, in the, the exception is again the layers in this uh, fortress because there's a different soil chemistry but otherwise it's it's so hard to, and, and sometimes you find these little uh, bronze rivets from the combs you know, to hold together the three layers you find those or iron to hold Nothing else, and the bone is gone, and that's a pity. Yeah. One exception, shell mills. If we have them, then there's a lot of bones, but sadly, we do not have shell mills from the Viking Age and the islands, only from the Iron Age. Okay, thank you very, very much for this. Fascinating talk and thanks for from everybody I'm sure out there connected online and in Trondheim. Oh yes, there's messages coming in on the chat here saying saying thanks for the presentation. So we'll end with a round of applause. Yeah. Thank you. Pleasure.